Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first online lecture. I hope that you are ready. Uh, make sure you have some note-taking materials. Remember, you are responsible for this information, and this will be on the current uh, APUSH test. Uh, remember, you can pause this video at any time so that you can see a slide better. The slides are also, remember, on our website, mrduncansisterclass.com, in PDF form, so you can go back and look at those or look at those as I lecture if that helps you. Let's go ahead and get started today. I thank everybody for being on Zoom yesterday and us discussing our uh, documentary we got to watch about the fatal flood and then about the reading of, of Sakio and Benzetti. So let's kind of just go back and, and recap some things. Uh, we had a very strong president, Teddy Roosevelt, and then we had Taft, right? Uh, then we have that odd election of 1912 where uh, a third party comes in second, a sitting president comes in third, uh, and the Democrats are back in charge. After Woodrow Wilson, the Republicans are back, and they want to roll everything back to normalcy, right? They want to go back to the good old days of the 1890s where business was king. Um, and the 1920s have been very prosperous, much like the Gilded Age. Uh, and we really have some presidents who kind of fall between the cracks. Remember, after a war, it is not uncommon that Congress is strong. And so let's look at these presidents who fall in between that we haven't looked at yet. Um, I know this is not exactly the right chapter in the book we're in. Uh, this chapter used to be divided, and so that's kind of how this lecture is. So let's talk about the politics of boom and bust before we get to our, our next Roosevelt. Here we go. So, in the politics of boom and bust, we have Warren G. Harding, right? He's from 1921 to 1923. Uh, he is from Ohio, and we have a lot of Republicans at this time, remember, from Ohio. So... He has been vice president under Calvin Coolidge, uh, old silent, you know, Cal there. Uh, and he was a newspaper editor and a publisher. And so, again, a very informed guy. So our 29th president, Warren G. Harding. Well, this Republican old guard comes back after Wilson and stays in charge for quite a while. Warren Harding, he's handsome, but he's not necessarily our strongest president as far as intellect. He failed to see corruption in his own cabinet. We'll look at a, a scandal. Remember, we're back to the idea of Republicans and scandals. Uh, that connects back to Grant's administration. And he did have quality. Uh, he didn't have, I'm sorry, uh, qualities. Uh, people like Charles Evans Hughes, he did. I can't talk today. He did have quality people like Charles Evans Hughes and Herbert Hoover. There's Herbert Hoover again. Uh, I just want to kind of lay that in the back of your mind. We saw that in the documentary. Uh, Herbert Hoover feeds uh, Europe in World War One, uh, helps America out during a flood. Uh, he works under Harding's administration uh, and, and sees a bigger picture. I mean, he is working his way to the presidency step by step. Uh, on paper, Hoover should have been one of our strongest presidents ever. But unfortunately, he is a man of his times. And we often talk about, is it the times that make a president or is it the man that makes the president? Uh, think about people like Andrew Jackson or Teddy Roosevelt. So, the GOP, they are ready, the grand old party, the Republicans, right? Um, Harding had hoped to improve on laissez-faire. We say, how do you improve on that? Well, roll back some of those things, remember, that had been put in place, all those progressive ideas of government regulation. Under Harding, corporations would expand again, and antitrust laws were not as enforced. Uh, to be honest, they were ignored. So we see again the rise of the large business, the, the big business, even the monopolies coming back. And notice the train down there, right? Those railroads, they are the ones that control the lifeline to communities across the country. Now, he put men who were sympathetic to the railroads on the Interstate Commerce Commission. Remember, the Interstate Commerce Commission had been set up to regulate uh, the price of uh, shipping. Uh, remember, that was an idea of the populists uh, and even the progressives and farmers. Well, now you've got people who are running the railroads who are from the railroads. So what's their motivation there? It's probably profit. Well, what does America look like after the war? Well, we've already talked about some of the culture, right? Uh, the culture is that we're booming. Uh, we've got flappers, uh, new inventions. The stock market is on the rise. Uh, we also see that they go back to a civilian economy. Remember, we had the War Industries Board, uh, which told you what to make, when to make, how much to make, how much to pay your employees. Well, again, this is rolling back to go back to laissez-faire. Let's get the government out of business. They sold off uh, ships they didn't need anymore. They reduced the Navy. We've seen this before, remember, with Jefferson. 
and labor had lost a lot of its power during the war. It was, un, you know, you weren't supposed to strike during a war. That was unpatriotic. Now, some groups try. Uh, what do they get labeled? Well, anarchist, and we saw that uh, in the reading of Sacchio and Vanzetti. So, there are strikes right after the war because people are wanting to say, hey, we've sacrificed for several years. Uh, it's time for us to kind of make more money. And there is a labor strike in 1919. It's broken. Again, we see the president coming down not on the side of labor, uh, but on the side of business. And so labor actually shrinks during this time by 30%. Again, not workers, but the members of labor unions. And in 1921, America creates the Veterans Bureau. Uh, the, today we call it the Veterans Administration, the VA. Right here, here's an opportunity for all these men who sacrificed, remember, with selective service, and we're going to talk more about that with the Bonus Army. Um, we have men who have come back damaged from war. Uh, psychological damage, which was still being it was new. Uh, they didn't have the term PTSD like we have today. Uh, they often talked about someone being shell-shocked. Uh, you have men coming back missing limbs, parts of their bodies, um, uh, other causes because of gas warfare, blindness. And so how do we take care of these guys who fought for democracy, right, to spread that democracy, to make it safe all over the world? Well, we're going to create a Veterans Administration. Um, it's a voting block, uh, kind of like we saw with the Union Army after the Civil War, the Grand Old Party, right, the Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, you can see the connection there. Uh, it's going to start off, but it also is going to be scandalous uh, because the gentleman put in charge of it is going to take a lot of the money, uh, and the construction money is going to be funneled into uh, private pockets. And so we kind of see, unfortunately, that the VA has not always had a good history of managing its money. We'll also see how veterans are treated after a war. Um, and is there a president coming up who decides to do something a little bit differently? Hint, there is. So, the aftermath of war. Veterans organized into pressure groups. Uh, they want things from Congress. Again, they're a voting block. Remember, we're not that far from the Gilded Age. Um, and a lot of people still remember that it only took a few thousand votes one way or the other to uh, be a part of the presidency. There's the school bell this morning. I guess we're officially in class. The American Legion uh, demonstrated patriotism and even a militant patriotism, right? Uh, these are the people who are going to be yay, 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 raw America. Um, well, what about immigration? What about some of those countries they saw when they were there and they came from? Uh, did they see that uh, maybe they need to do um, things uh, differently here? Uh, remember, these are folks that are anti-radicalism, so we're going to have uh, that Red Scare. Uh, we're going to have um, an Attorney General, Mitchell Palmer. Remember, go and uh, make America safe. All right. All right. So they're going to have an aggressive push for veterans' benefits. They're asking for something called adjusted compensation. This is going to make a little more sense when we get into the Bonus Army, but I want you to know that it's being introduced here in 1921. So... They eventually, in 1924, win the Adjusted Compensation Act. This says that in the future, they're going to get a bonus for the time they spent in the Army. Remember when we talked about selective service, and we said some of you went out west to farms and harvested crops, some of you worked in factories, and yes, some of you went into the military. Well, those of you who worked in factories, you got paid. You got paid a good wage, you may have gotten paid overtime, um, and you did not risk your life. And so now as men have come back from the front, uh, people who stayed here, even though they were under government contract, they had to work at that factory, uh, they seem to have been do doing better financially than, than a doughboy, right, than a guy who's been sent overseas. And they say, we should get something for that. And so they're trying to even out the wages they lost while at war. Um, it is going to add to the cost of the war. It's going to add $3.5 billion to the cost of the war. Uh, but again, it's going to be paid in the future. And again, we're, we're going to talk more about that. So, remember, during the war, the government had controlled the economy. Um, it quickly steps back. From, remember, Republicans are very laissez-faire. So the War Industry Board disappears. Um, they return the railroads back to private management. And again, now that the ICC is run by railroad guys, pretty much they're on their own. Um, this, again, crushed people's hopes. Uh, the old progressives and the uh, populists who thought the railroads might be nationalized. Uh, but that doesn't happen. And Congress uh, is going to pass a new Transportation Act, which actually encourages the privatization of railroads. So again, railroads are not going to be run by the American government. They also have this new philosophy, and it is that this will save the railroads, that the government shouldn't be in charge of it. 
The government tries to get out of the shipping business. You can imagine during war, the government took over ships and the maritime industry because it had to get men and supplies overseas. Uh, well, they're going to step back from that. And they're going to have the Merchant Marine Act, which authorized shipping boards to sail most of the wartime fleet. <clears throat> We've got to remember, we were in the war a short time. But already, uh, as we declare war, we are building this huge fleet of ships to get supplies. Uh, most of them are taken up to a harbor. I think it's in Maine somewhere. And they still sit there today. I mean, they're wooden vessels. They've sunk. Uh, they've formed kind of a reef environmental area. Um, if you want to look that up, you can. Uh, but again, we don't need the ships. We're not shipping things overseas. So we're just once we bring our guys home, we're done. <clears throat> so... Under the La Follette, yeah, the La Follette, remember Battle and Bob, the Follette Seamen's Act, American shipping could not thrive in competition with foreign, with foreign shipping. Uh, part of it is how we're going to staff those ships um, and what happens when they come into American ports. And so people realized that they were going to have to change the way we do shipping. Uh, remember, a lot of the cruise ships today, uh, they are foreign flagged, right? They may leave an American port. Uh, but they're foreign flags, so they don't have to follow the rules. If you are sailing in America and you only go to American ports, you've got to use an American crew. You've got to follow American law. Uh, that's why river cruises in America are more costly sometimes, uh, because they have to follow American laws, not where they are flagged. And again, if you're sailing only in America, you're flagged in America with those rules. <clears throat> so, labor kind of limps along. Uh, there's a steel strike crushed in 1919. Uh, the Railway Labor Board actually cuts wages, and there's nothing that they can do about that. Um, and the Attorney General is going to actually say, hey, strikers, you're, you're hurting America because you're su shutting down our shipping lanes. Well, what else? Well, in the 1920s, something interesting happens in the Middle East. We technically are at war until 1921. Yes, the war in Europe is over, but you've got to remember there is a Russian Civil War. We still have troops in Russia. Yes, we have invaded Russia. Trying to put, and there goes the bell, trying to put the white Russians back on the throne. So, we have troops. In 1921, the Russian Civil War is over. And after that, our guys come home. So we really are at war till then, but, but not like you see in, in World War One. The U.S. participates, but is not a member of the League of Nations. Remember Woodrow Wilson? It's his idea. He brings it back. Um, Henry Cabot Lodge keeps it from passing uh, because of that idea of going to war without Congress being involved. We look for oil in the Middle East, and surprise, it's found. Yes, oil in the Middle East. You can see my little comment there. Nothing but peace and happiness forever. By the way, as I'm making this video here in the COVID epidemic, um, oil has dropped to around $20 a barrel. Guys, that's amazing. It was 57 I think, before all this happened. It sometimes has gone up to as high as 75 uh, The Middle East relies a lot on that oil uh, for its income, so we'll see what happens there. But as you know, we are involved in the Middle East today, um, and one of our policies as America is to make sure, and it's been the policy uh, probably since the 70s, uh, that we would make sure that the Middle East stays open for business. Why? Because America needs that oil. Um, that oil is easy to get out of the ground, and so when oil prices drop, um, some oil here in America is not easy to get out of. It's costly, and so what you're going to actually see is that it's easier to buy that oil from the Middle East during these times than it is to produce our own. So we'll see how that plays out. We also are going to actually try to disarm. Uh, we're going to have an, an armaments conference, and we saw the uh, horrific destruction we saw that um, the industrialization created just these killing machines. What if we actually stepped back and we began to make less arms? Uh, what if we tried to go back to that time where we were going to be more peaceful, that we thought was going to happen at the turn of the century? Remember the World's Fair of Chicago, 1893? Everything was going to be amazing in the next century. Well, here we are in 1921 with death and destruction uh, and, and a world war. Remember, it's not called a world war or World War I until later. Uh, it's the Great War, or hopefully the war to end all wars. So, let's look at what happens at the Washington Naval Conference. We're going to talk about disarmaments in here quite a bit. Uh, we often think of countries trying to look at arms and limit them as a Cold War idea. Uh, with SALT, right, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties, and there are several of those. 
We think about like Kennedy and the missile gap. These are all words that we'll talk about in the future. Um, but we often talk about limiting nuclear weapons or nuclear warheads. Well, here they're going to limit the weapons of war of their time period. And they're actually going to have a conference in Washington uh, where they do this. So in Washington, <clears throat> they limit the tonnage of battleships and they limit how many battleships each country can have. Notice they also uh, have some aircraft carrier tonnage. Well, you're limited on the number of battleships. You're not limited on aircraft carriers. And that probably sets up something for you. Um, that means that a country in the Pacific, Japan, may be limited to how many battleships they can have, so they're going to turn to a carrier force. Uh, think about the attack of Pearl Harbor. It's not battleship focused. Now, they're trying to destroy our battleships, and they hope that our carriers were going to be in that harbor. Remember, we get Pearl Harbor because of imperialism, because we take over Hawaii. Um, the Japanese are going to be able to basically build lots of aircraft carriers and um, dominate the air war and the Pacific for, for the first part of that conflict. So, you remember, Japan is one of the eight powers at this time period. Uh, most of them are European. America has joined that group, and Japan is the only Asian power. They helped out, remember, the Allies. Uh, they, they watched shipping lanes, and they protected uh, from German attack and, and other groups in the Pacific so that the English and the French could concentrate their forces. So Japan really thinks that it's a friend of all these countries. But unfortunately, remember the Treaty of Versailles, it's kind of shoved to the side and forgotten about. And so <clears throat> they begin to establish this policy of Asia run by Asians. And so we're going to see imperialism hit Japan. And where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go to China. And they're going to go to those islands in the Pacific. Well, who owns some of those islands in the Pacific? Yes, America does. So that, that just kind of sets that up for that. <clears throat> All right. So the war is over. We're providing Europe with a lot of materials. Uh, but this won't happen forever. And so what do we do? Well, we want to make sure the American economy stays strong. We want to make sure Americans buy American goods. Not using that cheap labor of Europe to make cheap goods and flood our market. So let's raise the tariff, right? Let's raise the tariff on imported goods. This sounds like a great idea. Remember, we have debated the tariff in this class several times. We've seen it in several presidencies. Um, the idea is that you will protect American business by making foreign goods expensive. So businesses do not want, again, Europe to flood us. So let's look at these tariffs. The Fordney McCumber tariff raises the tariff from 27% to 35%. That means for every dollar a good cost coming from Europe, it now costs $1.35. Um, again, it raises money for the American government. It keeps those cheap goods out. Um, and if you like European goods, you're just going to have to pay for them. However, this is a problem. Europe needs to sell goods. They've got to get their economy back on track. Uh, they have borrowed a lot of money from America. They have borrowed a lot of uh, equipment and bought a lot of equipment from America. So it's kind of a, a two-edged sword here. We want to protect American jobs, but we also want Europe to pay its debts. Well, how's Europe going to pay its debts? By selling us stuff. Well, that's great, but we're going to make you sell it here and put a big tax on it, which means American goods are going to be cheaper, which means it may take longer for you to pay that off. And you can see this is going to set up a dangerous situation, uh, and we'll look at a chart here in a moment. Well, what about scandals? Yes, there are going to be scandals. Charles Forbes. Uh, was caught with his hand in the till. Guys, the Veterans Administration or the Veterans Bureau had been set up to build hospitals across America to help our veterans uh, recover from the war and come to find out that he had taken a lot of the money. Remember, we saw this in the Grant Administration uh, with the scandals. So Charles Forbes, who's supposed to be head of the Veterans Bureau, he's a construction contract guy, um, he's giving out a lot of contracts, which means he's receiving some bribes, uh, he's funneling some of the money into his own pocket, uh, and again, this is a huge operation with millions of dollars, and it starts out with scandal. Sadly, the VA from time to time shows up in the news usually because of scandal, uh, either organizationally or um, they're not taking care of our veterans or our financial issue. The Teapot Dome scandal. This is about oil. Uh, remember, oil is now the new commodity. Everybody is using cars and uh, they need oil not just for fuel, but for all the lubrication of all that machinery uh, that ran the war. Uh, we realize oil is going to be important in the future for our military. Think about like tanks and planes. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. The whiskey scandal. Ah, uh, yes. Remember, it is prohibition. But some people, are, again, are using their diplomatic immunity to bring in whiskey in the United States. The 
the cases are not being searched, no one knows what's in them, and so they're able to bring booze into America tax-free uh, and then sell it illegally. And this is what some people in the administration are doing. So again, alcohol uh, is a problem here. And then, actually, Harding dies. If you notice his dates, he's not in there very long, right? He He's just not uh, a president for very long. He's going to die in office. And again, this is kind of like Grant. Really, the scandals came out after Grant's presidency. They were during it. So he doesn't live to see these scandals. Um, and so let's see what happens here. Let's talk about Teapot Dome for a moment. Well, Teapot Dome is an oil scandal that involves lands out west. We've already seen this idea of the National Forestry Service and the Secretary of the Interior under Taft. How do you manage your resources? Is the best way to manage them for the American good? Uh, do you hold large tracts of land? so that people can't use them for things? Or do you manage the resources in those for the betterment of the American people? So, the reason it's called Teapot Dome is there's this big rock structure. It's not there today. It has eroded away and, and crumbled. But it kind of looked like a teapot. You may remember the little song you sang as a child, you know, uh, here is, I am a teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle. Here is my spout. Tip me over and pour me out. I don't know if you sang that song. One year, but it kind of looks like an old teapot. Well, in the Teapot Dome scandal, um, the issue is that uh, American government agencies are bribed uh, to actually get the oil off of these national lands that were supposed to be set aside uh, as, as national forest uh, and, and national parks. Uh, so can you allow a private company to come into national lands and then get resources and then charge the, I mean, this is the American public's resources. How, how do you let a private company go get it and then charge the American public again? So, so that's some of the scandals that we see during this time period. So, it is this time, remember, that we're very pro-American values, so we're going to see that with Harding and Coolidge. Um, again, Harding dies after two years in office. The scandal, the teapot dome breaks, all right? Um, and Calvich Coolidge is going to become our president. So, Teapot Dome, uh, you can see here the political cartoon. Let's analyze that for a moment. Uh, you see a teapot, if you don't recognize that. Uh, you see a steamroller, right? Um, and again, they're, they're using this to roll over the American people. Now, this is where it gets very interesting in the Teapot Dome scandal. Kind of look at, at what I have here on the screen. So, the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, leases a naval reserve oil land. So they had set aside land that had oil in it for the Navy. Uh, again, that oil was supposed to go for when we go to war, if we go to war, when we go to war, uh, that the Navy would have oil reserves. They would need that, again, for lubrication uh, as well as fuel. Well, it was there in Wyoming, and, and an oil man, Henry Sinclair, or Harry, excuse me, Sinclair, uh, if any of you collect um, memorabilia of the gas and oil industry. Uh, Sinclair Oil was a huge um, gasoline company here in America. You can still find, uh, if you go to like shows or old car things where they have old signs, you'll see Sinclair signs. Uh, they often use the dinosaur as their logo. You know, the dinosaurs had died and uh, had become this oil. So, Sinclair and Edward Doney, uh, they won't be have access to this land. I mean, it's just sitting there with oil underneath it. Um, and we're not at war. We're not going to war. The war's over. So why don't we pump some of that oil out? Uh, we'll give the American government a fee to do that, and then we'll take this oil to market and we'll make a lot of money. Well, Fall received a bribe. So the Secretary of the Interior receives a bribe of $100,000 to let them do this. Now, he receives about three times that from Sinclair. So the Secretary of the Interior makes $400,000 in under-the-table money. Well, this is a scandal, and it goes to trial. Here's what's interesting. Fall is actually going to be found guilty of taking a bribe. That's what he's going to be charged with. But when Sinclair and Doney go to trial, remember these are big businessmen, lots of lawyers. Um, they're the ones that gave the money. They're actually going to be acquitted. So, so think about that. A guy is going to be charged with taking a bribe. But the people that he got the money from, the court say they didn't do it. How can you get a bribe when these guys, the courts say, legally didn't give a bribe? So again, quite the scandal. Quite the scandal. 
So, Calvin Coolidge is going to become president in 1923. Remember, he's a vice president. Vice presidents aren't picked because they think one day they'll be in power. Um, Calvin Coolidge is a very quiet person. All right. So here he is, and he gets the nickname Silent Cal. So, is Washington for sale? Uh, under the Coolidge administration, um, they're going to have to deal with the issues of Harding. And so, again, it, you see these pictures of where everything in Washington, if you can bribe the right people. Um, so, again, again, after a war, just like the Civil War, we saw all that grantism, right? Uh, we're, we're seeing, again, the same kind of thing here. So, Calvin Coolidge, uh, he is a Yankee, right? He's from the New England area. Um, and he is very serious, and he doesn't speak a whole lot. There, there's a famous story told about Calvin Coolidge that a woman walked over to him at a dinner party and said, Mr. Coolidge, I have a bet with a friend that I can get you to say more than three words. And he t supposedly turned to her and said, you lose, and went back to eating his dinner. I don't know if the story's true, but it just kind of says he's kind of a no-nonsense kind of guy. Remember, he's not a Teddy Roosevelt. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt has changed the presidency, but he's kind of going back to those Gilded Age guys where he's more of a figurehead. So, under Calvin Coolidge, he's a moral guy, which helps with cleaning up the scandals of Washington. Uh, we're going to see that uh, later after a president resigns, and we have a, a, a an Eagle Scout, Gerald Ford Wright, come into power and kind of help America feel like things are going to be better. He was not touched by the scandals. He was not a part of that. Um, and again, he, he tended to be a very bright man. Uh, he, he had some brains behind it. Just wasn't a big talker or, or needed the public spotlight. So Calvin Coolidge, um, 1923 to 1929. So you're going to see he runs again. Um, notice that he's born in 1872. So he's born after the Civil War. Born in Vermont, um, elected as vice president. He's from Massachusetts. He was a lawyer. Uh, and again, his vice president is going to be Charles Dawes. So number 30, Calvin Coolidge. Um, I'll probably put a link on here at some time to like the president's videos that show on the History Channel. It would be good to watch those uh, as a review when we get closer to the exam. So, once again, farmers are frustrated. Why? Well, during World War I, they fed the world. Remember Herbert Hoover set up that farmers and America would feed the world because those fields in Europe uh, were battlegrounds. They were soaked in blood, not growing food. And so farmers had been able to sell a lot of things, export a lot of goods. They also had been able to get a good rate from the railroads. Why? Because the government was in charge of the railroads. Well, now the government's not in charge of the railroads. Uh, they can charge what they want. And eventually Europe is going to start growing its own food. But farmers had gone out and bought a lot of equipment. They had borrowed to do that. They had borrowed to buy much of land. Uh, and now what's going to happen? Well, they have more food than they have customers. Well, what happens when you have too much of a product? The price goes down. Watch for that as we head into uh, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. So, War I had given farmers a lot of prosperity. Uh, tractors had made them be able to plow acres and acres of land and harvest acres and acres of land with, with very little labor. So, this overproduction is going to plague them. Um, the, the, the prices of food are going to fall. Well, Coolidge voted against agricultural relief. Uh, he saw it as not capitalistic. He said, if we're giving the farmers money to help them, then, again, that's not laissez-faire. That, that's not the invisible hand. That's the visible hand of government. And so he actually isn't going to help farmers. Well, again, are we going to see another party? Will the populace come back? Uh, stay tuned. And then in 1924, we have another three-way race for the White House. We saw this in 1912, remember? A party split, and it gave it to the Democrats. So can the Republicans keep it together this time? Well, Coolidge is chosen by the Republicans. Well, why? Well, because he's there, right? Uh, and that's the easiest way to go. The Democrats are actually going to, with the backing of the KKK, um, try to win America over. Remember, the Klan has resurged. We looked at that in the culture of the 1920s. This is the politics of the 1920s. And the progressives are back. Yeah, the progressives say, hey, 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 these Republicans are trying to roll back all the things we got for America. And who is going to be their leader? There he is, Badlin Bob, Robert La Follette, right? Um, and so you, the progressive party is going to come back. Well, who are progressives going to take votes from this time? 
Will it be Republicans? Will it be Democrats? Will they even make a show? Well, Coolidge is going to win the presidency of the United States. I already told you, he gets a second term. Uh, and so let's see how this plays out. In the 1924 election, look at what happens here. 15 million for Coolidge, 8 million for the Democrat Davis, uh, and 4 million for the Progressive. So the Progressive Party um, kind of had a resurgence there for a while. I remember the Progressive Party had been led by William Jennings Bryan and other people along the way. Now, they don't get a lot of electoral votes. They're probably spread out, um, and Coolidge gets a large amount. But again, this is not the Gilded Age, right? Uh, I mean, look at that. He, definitely there's a win there. So who did the progressives take votes from? Maybe we could argue it is the Democrats, but even if they had gone in with the Democrats, like remember they did with um, William Jennings Bryan one time. He was the candidate for both parties. Uh, they still would not have won the popular election or the Electoral College. So Calvin Coolidge, old silent Cal, uh, becomes our next Republican president, 1924. So, if we look by county, notice this is not by state. Again, the solid Democratic South. I want you to keep remembering that. The Democrats could count on the South. If you were a Democratic candidate, you did not have to campaign as a president in the South. Re remember, Republicans were the party of Lincoln. They were the party of abolition. African Americans had led those parties for a while uh, to victory, but now they're slowly being disenfranchised. The Klan is back. All the things that we talked about that are happening there with African Americans. Um, many of you saw in that documentary, the, the Flood of 27, right? That African American life really had gone back to the way it was. It just wasn't called slavery anymore. It was called sharecropping, and it was legal. So notice again the progressives. Um, they are more of a Western party. We, we've seen that. Uh, and then the Republicans uh, there, the New England area, obviously, where um, Silent Cal is from. So what about foreign policy during this time period? We just fought a war. We, in, in the Americans' mind, we had won the war, right? We got there, and within months it was over. The stalemate that had bogged down Europe in trench warfare. Well, are we going to stay involved? Well, we had the opportunity with the League of Nations, remember and we choose not to be a part of it. America comes back to something called isolation. Uh, remember, Washington had warned us, no political parties, no foreign entanglements. We went, did what we did, and we've come back home. So isolationism is going to basically leave us out of the League of Nations and the world court. And as the 30s come on, that's going to be a problem. Europe is going to change in the 30s. We're going to have a new form of government, fascism, uh, and you probably know where that story is going. There's also European debt is an issue. Uh, they owe us a lot of money for goods they have already bought and used in war. How do we get that money back? Well, remember, we raised the tariff. So they're not going to be able to easily sell goods here. We want them to buy our goods. That's how we're going to make money while their industries are trying to recover. And we had given loans to Germany. Yeah, Germany is in a bad situation. They have a change of government. You may remember the Weimar Republic, for those of you who took AP Euro. And so businessmen are looking for a way and somewhere to invest. And they decide to invest in this new Germany um, that's come back after World War I as they rebuild themselves, and they think they're going to make a quick buck on their money. Well, the economy is strong. The stock market is strong. The problem is Germany's taking a lot of this money, and instead of putting it in infrastructure or making a factory or paying their people, they're just immediately turning it over to France and Britain. And France and Britain are immediately sending it right back to the United States. Uh, we often call this the stupid circle of money, and so I'm going to show you a chart here to help you better understand. So, here it is. This is a chart I would want you to look at. Uh, if we were doing class like we normally do, uh, I would ask you to draw it. It wouldn't hurt you to do that now. If you want to pause for a moment and draw it out so as I talk about it, uh, you can do that. But let's see what happens. Well, the war's over. You haven't been able to buy a lot of wartime goods. You, you've saved a lot of money. So you're buying some new things, maybe a new car, uh, maybe a washing machine or, or something for the house. But you've still got some money left over, and you say, hey, I want to invest this. Uh, the stock market's going up. I want to be a part of that. And so maybe you give your money to the Wall Street bankers. Well, Wall Street bankers are looking for a place to put your money to make maximum growth. And they decide to loan money to Germany. 
Now remember, Germany has a lot of war debt. Plus, they have to pay back millions of dollars to the French and the English because of the war that supposedly they started. Remember, it was really started with Austria-Hungary and Serbia, but there is no Austria-Hungary to get your money from. Well, Germany is taking that money, and instead of building factories and roads and, and creating a better economy, they immediately are paying off Great Britain and France because they want to get them out of their business. Um, so when that money comes in, it goes immediately to Great Britain and France. Well, Great Britain and France, with this influx of money, uh, they're probably using some of it to uh, rebuild their factories and, and to pay uh, some things that they owe in their own country, but they're basically shoving it right back to the United States, to the U.S. Treasury. I don't know if you remember when we talked about funding the war. You bought war bonds. Well, now the Treasury is flush with cash. It wants you to turn those war bonds back in. And so you're turning them back in and getting your money back. Well, now again, you're flush with money. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to give it to Wall Street. And what's Wall Street? So, guys, this circle was so big and the money was so, and we're talking millions of dollars being moved around, that no one really saw that it was the same money. I, I want you to imagine for a moment that I had a $100 bill in class. And I held up the $100 bill and I said, look, I have $100. And somebody walks in the room and they see me with a hundred and you with nothing. And they think, oh, you know, there's one rich guy and a bunch of poor students. Well, what if I go and take that hundred dollars and I break it into ones and I start passing the ones around the class and somebody walks in and sees all this money floating around the class and they say, whoa, what happened in here? Look at the economy. Look how awesome it is. Guys, there's still just a hundred dollars. It just looks like things are really happening here. But in the end, all that hundred is going to pass right back around the circle of our class and right back to me. Did we make any money? No. Did we lose any? Hopefully not. Uh, where we're going to see this issue is when people put it in the stock market and those stocks go up, they think they're making money. Well, they're making money on paper. It looks like a lot of money. The problem is when the market crashes, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later, um, a lot of people are going to feel poor. Guys, if I have $101 laying around here, man, it looks like we've got a lot of money. But if I have a $100 bill, you know how that is. As soon as you break it, you spend it, right? And so somebody might walk in and think, wow, that Duncan's class is really going in there. It's, it's the same money. It's just going around and around and around. It was such a big circle, people couldn't see it. So kind of see this. Um, I do have a, a, a possible uh, quiz coming up where you will see this chart again. You might even be required to fill this chart out. So spend a little time with this money and, and with this chart. So 1928. Notice that's that's it. We're done with Harding and Coolidge. Um, again, they're kind of weak presidents. A few things happen there. In 1928, a man steps forward to run for president. Uh, he has been a member of the Republican Party. He is a self-made millionaire from the West. Um, he has fed Europe. He took care of us in a flood. Uh, he has served in presidential administrations. Herbert Hoover is going to run for president of the United States. Guys, to be honest, he's probably one of the most capable men and prepared for this job that we've seen in a long time. So again, is that enough? You know, think about Abraham Lincoln. Was it Abraham Lincoln the man? Or was it because he was put in a time of the Civil War that it showed parts of his personality we might not have seen had that not have happened? Guys, if there had been no Civil War, how would we think of Abraham Lincoln? Would he just be an okay president? Or would he show leadership in another way? Um, think about people like Franklin Roosevelt, who's elected in a depression uh, and then goes through into a world war. Um, was it the man or was it the times? Did the man and the times come together at the right time? Uh, was it the right man for the times, or was it a man who was shaped by those times, and now we think of them as the right man? So Herbert Hoover is going to be president. In 1928, Calvin Coolidge said, I do not choose to run. He's not going to run again. Remember, he, he took over part of Harding's term. He was elected once to his term. He could have run again. And remember, there, there's no limit on how many times. But he said he doesn't want to be president. And so he steps down. So, the successor is Hoover. He's nationally known. He's been in the newspaper headlines. People know that he can get things done. He's organized. He's self-made. Uh, this is the guy for America during this time uh, of resurgence of laissez-faire. So, 
he wins. Uh, but it is a mudslinging campaign. And the Democrats are going to run a Catholic. Now let's think about that for a moment. The Klan had just been strong. What were they? Anti-Catholic. The Democratic Party is going to run a Catholic. What did I just tell you about the South? The South, you could count on for Democratic votes. Can you count on the South for Democratic votes for a Catholic when the Klan has kind of had a resurgence in that area? Um, this is new. A lot of people are concerned that in Protestant America, remember that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that a Catholic may come to power. There were still people concerned that he may be more allied to the Pope uh, than to the Constitution. And this won't be the first time this question, well, it is the first time, it won't be the only time this question comes up. And we'll even talk about a president who has to basically have a press conference and address this issue. So that's what's going to happen. We also have the issue with alcohol. Um, Al Smith uh, is is thinking about letting alcohol be legal again. Remember, the Republicans have kind of gone blue laws. They've kind of gone moral. Uh, and so is that the America we want to return to? So here it is by state. Wow. The Democrats could count on the South, even in running a Catholic after a pro-KKK time period that was anti-Catholic. But look at the Republicans. Look at Herbert Hoover. Uh, think about what he had done for the country. Think about the name recognition he had. So we see that basically the Democrats almost look like a minority party here. Remember, they hadn't had a president to Woodrow Wilson, and now here we are after that, and it doesn't look like they're doing great. Um, so let's look at some numbers here. All right, Herbert Hoover. He is going to be president from 1929 to 1933. And remember, he was born in 1874, post-Civil War. He's going to live to 1964. So I want you to see that. He's going to live long enough to see the end of the Great Depression. He's going to see World War II. He's even going to help the government in World War II. Uh, he's from Iowa. Uh, he had been elected uh, from California uh, because he had made his money there in the mining industry. He's an engineer. And he's a hard worker. He is going to go out, and he believes if you work hard enough. Remember, he's from that Jackson-Turner thesis idea uh, that the rugged individual that if a man goes out and works hard enough, he can pull himself up by his bootstraps, and if you work hard, you'll get out of a problem. He's an engineer. He, he fixes things. Well, what happens when you become the president of an economy that fails, and you can't fix it? And no matter how hard you work, it doesn't get better. Think about how that affected him probably emotionally. So our 31st president, Herbert Hoover. Yeah, we're on our third president in this lecture. There again, you can see. And remember, should we be electing someone who wants to bring back alcohol? Uh, Al Smith had wanted to do that. So let's look at the numbers there. Uh, notice quite a few people voting in this election, uh, more than in the last. Uh, look at the electoral vote, 444, Al Smith 87, and yes, the socialists were still out there running candidates. All right. Um, notice he gets 57.4 of the popular vote. Uh, so, again, it's kind of a landslide for the Republicans. We won't see some of these until later. So, what does Herbert Hoover do? Well, he begins to look into farm protection bills. And he's going to raise the tariff. That's right. We're going to charge Europe more for sending their goods here when they need to be selling goods to pay off debt. We're going to raise it to 60%. Guys, that's from 35%. That means for every $1 item, it's now going to cost $1.60. If I go to McDonald's and I buy a dollar Coke, but because it comes from Europe, it's now $1.60, I probably look for something else to drink. Now, I'm probably going to look for an American-made product, which is what they want you to do. The problem is we still need Europe to be economically successful to pay us back the money. And we're, this is going to cause international problems. It's American isolationism, American protectionism. So we're going to have a stock market crash. That money that's been flowing around in that big circle is going to come to a stop. And somebody's going to hold on to some of it, and a lot of people are going to hold on to none of it. October 29, 1929. October 29, we have a devastating crash, and we... we Call, we call this the beginning of the Great Depression. $30 billion lost. 
12 million unemployed, and 5,000 banks are going to fail. Remember, banks are not protected by the American government. They are businesses. You put your money into a bank, and if it goes bankrupt, you lose your money. Some of you may be familiar with the movie It's a Wonderful Life that's shown a lot around Christmas. There's a run on the bank. There's a run on the savings uh, industry. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more. So, Herbert Hoover, this pioneer, um, he is going to do some things for America, right? Um, he decides to withdraw $2.25 billion uh, to start projects to alleviate the Depression. He is going to come up, come up with these huge uh, projects that are going to put money back into the economy. Guys, let me tell you, we're in those times right now. And I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, look at the stimulus bill that was just passed because of what's going on with COVID. In there are billions of dollars. Some of it is going to go to big business. Why? To keep them alive. Hopefully to keep them employing their people. But what if they use that money to buy back their stock or to pay off their debt? And then money is going to go directly to people. Uh, families are going to be getting checks. Herbert Hoover believes in indirect relief. Now, this is going to be a compare contrast between Herbert Hoover and Roosevelt. Herbert Hoover believes that money should go to businesses and corporations. He's a businessman. That they will stay afloat, they will pay their employees, and then that money will trickle back into the economy indirectly. You do not give money directly to people. That violates laissez-faire. It lets people be dependent on the government. Um, in this current situation, if I may be so bold, what happens in two months if it isn't better? Does the government send you more money? Um, what happens then? Do they continue to bail out corporations? Um, there are some real concerns here that parallel this time period. So, things like the Hoover Dam. Uh, things like setting up a finance corporation to help businesses stay alive. Um, that's what we're going to see under his administration. Now, the Japanese are also going to use this time. They're going to leave. Um, they're going to leave. Well, I just totally lost my train of thought there. They're going to leave the League of Nations, and they're going to invade China. Uh, because, again, they're trying to create an Asia for Asians kind of thing. So what happens? Well, in September of 1931, Japan invades Manchuria. Well, what about the open door policy? What about all those countries in Europe and America who had ports there? Japan's going to shut all that down. This is breaking international law. Here's the problem. Nobody wants to go to war in a down economy. Wars are expensive. And it's not been that long since there had just been one. And so America just sits over here and lets it happen. Remember, we're not part of the league. Um, we're still trading with other places. Remember, at one time, Japan, we forced them to trade with us. Um, we figure that's an Asian issue. Um, we'll keep our imperialist little islands, and everything will be happy and fine. And we'll, we right now are concentrating on the economy. So here's where we're going to stop today. What would you do? Pretend you're the president and your country has unprecedented wealth, but suddenly it disappears. Well, guys, this may be a little too close to home, to be honest. Uh, this may be something you're seeing. Uh, we've looked at the stock market right before we all left. We've talked about investments. I told you about some things that, that I have done. and um, Let's just kind of look at what Herbert Hoover was kind of up against. Okay, So, 25% of the U.S. population is unemployed. That's adults. And remember, most households were one income. You know, you may live in a household where you have a mom and a dad, and they both have jobs. So if one of them loses their job, the other at least is bringing in some money. These are men, many times, who lose their job, which means you have no income coming in. None. Stock prices are going to fall. We'll talk a little more about the stock market crash. 5,000 banks are going to close, which means you were a good guy. You saved up your money. You put it in a savings bank. They loaned it out. It stimulated the economy. But the bank now doesn't have money. It literally doesn't have money. No one's paying their bills or their debts, and so the bank closes, which means all the money you had in that bank is gone. Millions of people lose their jobs. They lose their savings. You know, if you had $100,000 in the bank, you probably spend differently 
than if you lost it. If I give someone in here a $1 bill, a $10 bill, and a $100 bill and say, let's go to lunch, you guys probably choose different places for lunch, right? Foreign countries can't make their loan payments. That circle of money stops. Why? Because you've lost your savings. You're not putting it into Wall Street. Wall Street can't put it into Germany. Germany can't pay France and England. France and England can't pay us. They can't even make things to sell us because the tariff is now 60%. Foreign economies also collapse. Many of you remember in A-Push, we looked at Germany, and we looked how they were burning their money. It was it was better for them to burn their money to stay warm because it was worth nothing. They were taking wheelbarrows full of money to go buy a loaf of bread. American companies are not producing goods because nobody's buying anything. Guys, we're kind of in that right now. I mean, look what's happening. People are getting laid off. Um, maybe this is a little too close to home. Consumer spending declines. Yeah. The people don't have the extra money. The size of the economy shrinks. Uh, there is a drought out west. Those farmers who had plowed up all that land and were planting lots of it and growing all that food for Europe, well, they're not planting that land anymore. They don't need to grow food on that land. Um, they can't make their payments to the bank for their tractor. Their farms are going to go up for sale. So there's a lot of land laying around that's been tilled up, ready for planting, and nothing's happening. And then there's a drought, and literally the topsoil is going to blow away. We might watch a documentary on that called The Dust Bowl. I'll see if I can find that. And fascism is on the rise. We see it in Japan and Spain and Portugal and Germany and Italy. Um, this, this strong dictatorial leader who controls the state and possible war in the future. And this is kind of what Herbert Hoover inherits. And remember, this is a guy who's made his own money. Uh, I believe he was orphaned. Um, he knows that if he works hard, he can fix things, and he's an engineer. But guys, this is too big for Herbert Hoover to fix. Um, and he goes about it probably from the wrong direction. He goes about it with, with indirect relief. And so it looks like he's saving corporations instead of saving individuals and people. So Hoover's Great Depression. Here are some graphics for you. Um, I'll just kind of let you look. We're going to talk about the cause and the effect and how it snowballed. Um, and so Herbert Hoover, our 31st president. This is where I want to start when we meet together again uh, as a class. We'll do that on our next Zoom meeting. Uh, and so you can go up to this point, uh, read your book, uh, look over anything that you think will help you uh, on this, and we will get together on Thursday and spend time with Herbert Hoover and then work our way to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Miss you guys as always. I uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow in person, at least online, and um, hopefully we can be, there, be together again soon. Take care.